I want to welcome all of you to today's Tocqueville Project panel discussion. I'm Chris Sopranon, Assistant Professor of Philosophy here at the University of New Orleans and Director of the Alexis de Tocqueville Project on Law, Liberty, and Morality. For those of you unfamiliar with the Tocqueville Project, the project was established to examine enduring questions in the history of Western moral and political thought. Some of these issues include the values of a democratic society and their justification, the moral basis of civil liberties and private property, the role of religion in a free society, and an individual's obligations to others and to the state. In support of this mission, the project implements a number of initiatives, including public lectures, panel discussions, scholarly colloquia and reading groups, a six-week summer seminar in the history of political economy, and the Tocqueville Project Undergraduate Fellows Program, which provides opportunities for University of New Orleans undergraduates to interact with our visiting scholars, work closely with faculty on research projects, and receive financial support to assist in their scholarly development. Today, our focus is on the appropriate role of the state in providing public welfare programs. The salient fact about America today is that we appear to be a very deeply divided nation. We are perhaps more political than we've ever been, divided into red and blue camps. There are many reasons for this division, but it seems that the fundamental question that divides us is whether we should be doing more through government or less. Is it the role of government to collect taxes to fund higher education, public health care, and other social programs? Does the implementation of these programs overstep the bounds of good government? Are these policies consistent or inconsistent with the U.S. Constitution? Joining us to discuss this issue today are two of our nation's top constitutional law scholars, Roger Pilon and Louis Michael Seidman. Roger Pilon is the founder and director of the Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C. Prior to joining Cato, Pilon held five senior posts in the Reagan administration, including at State and Justice, and was a national fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution. His writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the Legal Times, the National Law Journal, Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Stanford Law and Policy, Stanford Law and Policy Review, and elsewhere. He has also appeared on ABC's Nightline, CBS's 60 Minutes 2, the Fox News Channel, NPR, CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, and other media. Pilon holds a BA from Columbia University, an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago, and a JD from the George Washington School of Law. Lewis Michael Seidman is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Constitutional Law at the Georgetown University Law Center. After graduating from Harvard Law School in 1971, Professor Seidman served as a law clerk for J. Skelly Wright of the, U of the D.C. Circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. He then was staff attorney with the D.C. Public Defender Service until joining the Law Center faculty in 1976. He teaches a variety of courses in the field of constitutional and criminal law. He's the co-author of a constitutional law casebook and the author of many articles concerning criminal justice and constitutional law. He's the author of four books, including his most recent, On Constitutional Disobedience, published by Oxford in 2012. In 2011, Seidman was elected to membership in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Roger Pilon and Louis Michael Seidman. So, Mike, where do we begin? Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. And, Chris, thank you so much for inviting, inviting me. Um, and I, I have to say it's just a pleasure to... Uh, talk with Roger again. We've done this uh, many, many times. Um, I have to say, I started out um, in the beginning thinking, Roger is such a smart person. It must be that if I just explain it to him right, he will come around to my way of thinking. Uh, after, I don't know, how many debates, I, I think I've just about given up on that. But I will say this, um, every time we do this, um, I learn something from Roger. Um, so it, it really is a a pleasure to uh, be on the same stage with him. Um, so the topic, at least as I understand it, um, the scope, the appropriate scope of government, uh, the welfare state, uh, the legitimacy of redistribution, it's extraordinarily broad. Um, some of the most important thinkers in the Western canon have devoted their lives to the topic, and there are whole libraries of books on the subject. So I think it's fair to say, um, I'm not going to get to the bottom of it in 10 or 15 minutes. And to be perfectly honest about it, I'm, I don't think I'm the person to get to the bottom of it. I don't have 
a comprehensive, worked out theory about the welfare state in all of its forms and at all times and all places. My thought about this tends to be much more pragmatic and situational. Uh, it depends on what specific program you're talking about um, and whether that specific program is well designed and whether it's likely to improve the lives of the people it's designed to help and whether it's going to make the country a better place. So rather than present some global worked out theory about this, what I want to do instead is take my time to um, isolate what seem to me to be three obstacles to clear thinking about the problem. So obstacle one, uh, the belief that we can or should determine the appropriate limits of government redistribution by reference to the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and my objection to that way of thinking about it uh, is part, a special case of a broader objection that I hold more generally to using the Constitution to solve questions of public policy. Um, now, I have to say, just start out by saying my ideas about this are not widely shared. Uh, there's not much that uh, Democrats and Republicans, blue state and red state, um, the Federalist Society and the American Constitutional Society agree about, but all of them agree that I'm nuts on this subject. <laughs> so I'm really proud to have brought the country together in this way. Um, but that said, I, I do think that um, if, if, if you step back for a moment and, and think about it, the really bizarre position is that we would look to the Constitution to solve our disagreements about questions like this. Um, the American Constitution was written at a time and in a place that has almost no resemblance to modern America. Uh, the United States was a small, mostly rural and agrarian country huddled along the eastern seaboard. Uh, large parts of the country were dependent upon slave labor. Travel was arduous and treacherous. Communication beyond one's immediate environment took weeks or months. Uh, the framers did not know the first thing about nuclear weapons, mass production, multiculturalism, cell phones, professional sports, modern birth control or global warming. Uh, they'd never heard of Martin Luther King or Bill Gates or Albert Einstein or Adolf Hitler or Lady Gaga. Um, it's impossible to imagine what they would have thought of women's liberation or evolution or gay marriage or psychoanalysis or reality television or globalization or the war on terror. Um, their world is not our world. Um, the people who wrote the Constitution were not a majority of the country even then. Uh, they were an aristocratic elite. Uh, many of whom thought, among other things, that it was just fine to own other human beings, uh, that women had no appropriate role to play in public affairs, and that people who did not own property should not be allowed to vote. Now, that's not to say, and I'm sure Roger will say, that these people um, had good ideas. It's not to say that they didn't have good ideas. They did have some good ideas. Some of them were really smart. Uh, Madison was something of a genius. Uh, the point is, though, that when their ideas were, are, are good, then we should follow them because they're good ideas, um, not just because they said them. Um, and of course, they also had some very bad ideas. And when their ideas are bad, we ought to forget about them and ignore them because they're bad ideas. So ultimately, the real point about this first obstacle to clear thinking is that the framers aren't here anymore. They are dead, OK? This is our country. Uh, we have a right to have the kind of country we want to have. As Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson said, allowing past generations to rule us is like allowing a foreign country to rule us. And we should no more allow that kind of intergenerational imperialism than we should allow France or Russia or the United Nations to rule us. So ironically, deciding on questions of individual freedom on the basis of the Constitution ends up violating the first three words of the Constitution itself. It, it, uh, the Constitution promises rule by we, the living people, not they, the dead people. OK, that's obstacle one. That's the most radical thing I'm going to say. 
Um, obstacle two. Um, um, many people think that what makes us free is disabling government. And by the way, that assumption is built into the language of some important provisions of the Constitution. So uh, we say, or the Constitution says, there is freedom of speech when Congress makes no laws, um, or that people are secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects when the government does not conduct unreasonable searches and seizures. Now, to say that withdrawal of government makes us free is not a complete myth. Sometimes it's true. The source of oppression is government. Uh, there's no doubt that the people in the Soviet Union then and in North Korea now are oppressed. And there's not much doubt about who's doing the oppressing. It's the governments of those country, countries. But here's the important point. It does not follow that government abstention always and everywhere is what guarantees freedom. Uh, anyone who thinks that's true uh, ought to go to the parts of the world where there are not effective governments, say Somalia, um, and ask people there how, how free they feel. I don't think the people in Somalia feel real free. And that's because when the government abstains from acting, that doesn't mean that there's nobody exercising power. What you have then is private, some private people exercising power over other private people. Um, in other words, what you have is private power substituted for public power. Now, um, sometimes in some circumstances, um, it's the exercise of public power that oppresses people. But sometimes, the exercise of public power frees people by constraining the private power that oppresses them. Uh, so let me take uh, a dramatic example that is within my lived memory, although not of many other people in this room. Um, consider the plight of African Americans before the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that prohibited discrimination in places of public accommodation. So um, uh, there were many African Americans who lived in the North, but whose families still lived in the South. And they wanted, like anybody else, they wanted on vacation to go down and visit their families. But they knew if they did that, if they took that trip, they would have to drive miles and miles before they could find an establishment that would let them use a bathroom or that would let them buy something to eat. They knew that they would be sub subject to constant humiliation and embarrassment and even physical violence if they upset the pervasive norms of racial subjugation that existed um, in large parts of the country. And so many people were not free to make that trip. And they didn't make it. Um, then came the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which, among other things, prohibited private individuals from discriminating in places of public accommodation. So this was an assertion of government power against private people, OK? People who didn't want to serve African Americans. Um, that was not the absence of government. That was the presence of government. Um, now, some people at that time, for all I know, Roger now, uh, thought and think that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was therefore unconstitutional because that was government intervention that interfered with individual freedom. But I think most of us, today at least, can see that that is just nonsense. That is a mistake. Does any sensible person today think that the country was more free when African Americans who wanted to engage in perfectly ordinary activity were at the mercy of bigots and racists? I don't think so. Uh, surely, in that case, it was government intervention controlling private power rather than government abstention that promoted human freedom and, and flourishing. Now, it's important to emphasize that's not always going to be the case. Governments can be oppressive, they can be officious, they can be dictatorial, they can be incompetent. But private people can be all those things also. Um, and the fact that um, uh, sometimes it's private power that, rather than public power that gets in the way. I, I, I can illustrate with another example that you might think of as 
coming from the other side of the political spectrum. Um, so um, the Fourth Amendment requires that people be uh, secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. And it says, in effect, that, well, people will be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects if the government does certain things, like only search on the basis of probable cause or only with a warrant. Um, but I don't think that's so obvious. Um, if you live in a high crime neighborhood, what may make you insecure in your person, person, house, papers, or effects is the threat of armed robbers, rapists, murderers um, who might break into your house and take your papers or might, might uh, harm your person. And it, it might well be that you're made more insecure rather than less secure if the government is hampered from making the kinds of searches and seizures that are, that are going to control that private, those private exercises of power. It might be, it might not be, right? As usual, it all depends. It depends on what the facts are. Um, and that leads to the third obstacle I want to identify to clear thought about this. And that is the belief that private markets without government intervention are presumptively fair and just. Um, and my guess is that it's that myth that lies behind the other two, and that is a myth that is deeply pernicious. Um, and I want to illustrate the perniciousness not with some uh, case or statute, but um, with my own personal biography, if you don't mind my doing that, because frankly, this hits me where I live. So uh, I grew up in um, an upper middle class family that lived in the suburbs. Um, my family was intact. Both my mother and father were highly educated. And both of them were deeply devoted to the welfare of their children. Um, I lived in a house filled with books. And my parents made clear from as long as I can remember that they would pay for any education that I wanted, and they did. Um, and perhaps even more significantly, they also made clear that whatever happened to me, I would always have a safety net, a place to go, people I could depend on, people who loved me, people who would be sure that I had enough money so I wasn't out on the street. Now, I'd like to say I ought to be rewarded for my excellent choice of parents. And, you know, I, I, that was a really smart thing to choose those people for parents. But I have to tell you, honestly, I don't really think I had much to do with it. Now, compare me for a moment to someone uh, who grows up in poverty without two parents, or maybe without any parents at all looking after them, surrounded by drugs and violence, with no role models, no safety net, lousy or no education, no assurance of a roof over their, he their head, maybe no love. Um, now, it's not as if people who grow up in those environments don't sometimes, by just remarkable hard work and per perseverance, escape those environments. It does happen. Um, and people who do that really ought to be congratulated. But the important point is that if someone from that environment <coughs> Uh, if, if someone from my environment ends up having a happy, contented, and productive life, and someone from the other environment ends up living fewer years with many fewer opportunities, many fewer material goods, um, and being much less happy, there's nothing natural, unavoidable, or just about that. That is something we could do something about. Um, it doesn't just exist in the world. It's something that we in the United States of America um, can do something about. We have an obligation to remedy that injustice. And that's something that I think we should be deeply ashamed of. It's, it happens way too often, and it's happening more and more. Um, the gap between rich and poor is growing. Um, the gap in life expectancy is growing. Um, um, there is... Um, there are things going on in this country that are deeply wrong. Now, I want to be clear. That's not to say we should abolish private property. It's not to say that I believe in, you know, communism or North Korea. Uh, the government should not have limitless power to transfer resources from one person to another. Um, so, so economic redistribution, 
government programs that take from the rich and give to the poor, um, up to a certain point, improve welfare. The reason they improve welfare is very simple. Money, like everything else, has a declining marginal utility. So if you take $100 from Bill Gates, he'll hardly notice it. It will not make him less happy that he can notice. And if you give it to somebody who's, who's really poor, that $100 is going to make them much happier. Um, but it's also true that at some point, redistribution begins to erode incentives. Uh, so the total size of the pie shrinks. So what we need to figure out is where, when one effect outweighs the other. And we need to redistribute to the extent that it makes the country a juster, happier, and wealthier place, and to stop at the point when it doesn't. Um, now, that's not where to stop. That's not the sort of question that can be determined by high theory. That's not something, pardon me, philosophers are, have any special knowledge about. Um, that question is contextual. It's, it's contestable. In other words, it's political. Um, and that, perhaps, is really the key point. In a truly free country, there's no escape from us having the burden and the privilege of deciding for ourselves what kind of government we want to have and how much government we want to have. And we cannot do that. We cannot exercise that freedom until we free ourselves from the shackles of a rigid ideology um, that pretends that these questions are easy and that people who disagree with us about the right answers are idiots or tyrants because they're not. Okay. Well, thank you, Mike. That was a nice disquisition, mostly wrong, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, nice try. Uh, I want to join uh, Chris and Mike in uh, saying we're grateful that all of you have come out on this beautiful evening to hear a debate of this kind when you could be doing uh, much that would be uh, more pleasurable, at least uh, from one point of view. But then there is the pleasure that comes from the life of the mind. Mike and I were both at the University of Chicago. That's the adage of the University of Chicago. And so that you are living that tonight is uh, to, be, to your credit. Now, um, Mike uh, began by saying that he, has, he had hoped over our many debates uh, that um, he would prevail upon me and convince me of the error of my ways. I never had any such hope with him. <laughs> <laughs> I could see right from the start that he was incorrigible. And so I'm going to take it uh, upon, as my task this evening to put forward the other side of the argument, responding to some of the things that he said uh, in the process. Our subject, as Chris said, is the welfare state. Let's start by defining that. We think of that as the state that attends to uh, aid to families with dependent children. Okay? This is our first conception of the welfare state. But that's only the start of that subject. Truth to tell, the welfare state includes any example of taking from A and giving to B. And there are a thousand and one examples. Taking from the rich and giving to the poor, Robin Hood, is only one manifestation of that. We have what's called reverse Robin Hood today. It's called corporate welfare. When we subsidize farmers, when we subsidize ethanol in the name of environmentalism, when even the environmentalists today don't support it because it is actually producing more greenhouse gases than if we didn't use ethanol and producing lower mileage per gallon and therefore requiring more gasoline. When we subsidize the farmers in a program like that, when we give, uh, give um, subsidies to sugar producers in the form of restrictions on 
uh, import of, uh, of sugar so that uh, they can win, enjoy the windfall profits and you pay only a nickel more per candy bar, that's a form of the welfare state. The welfare state takes, in fact, two fundamental forms. One is redistribution of goods. The other is redistribution in the form of regulation of actions. The first is done through the taxing power. You tax some people for the benefit of other people. The other form is redistribution in the idea of prohibiting someone from something that he would otherwise have a right to do or requiring him to do what he would otherwise have a right not to do for the benefit of someone else. And so those are the two forms of, of redistribution that you want to think of. Now, I'm going to take to these questions and some of the ones that Chris put out at the outset, a rather traditional conventional view. Unlike Mike, I think the Constitution is a very serious instrument that we need to return to. Unfortunately, today we live under something called constitutional law, which is only co occasionally connected to the Constitution, owing to the constitutional revolution that took place during the New Deal in 1937 and 38 as a result of the progressivism of that era and the threat by Roosevelt to pack the Supreme Court with six new members when it was deciding cases contrary to the way he thought they should be decided. But in order to lay that out, I'm going to have to start with the beginning. And the beginning is not with the Constitution, but with the Declaration of Independence because that's where the founders set forth their philosophy of government. Now, the founders, as Mike said, were a small group, to be sure. But if you think back, that was an advanced group at that point in time. We say the franchise was very limited in 1776 and 1787, 88, when the Constitution was ratified. As compared to what? The rest of the world? The rest of the world didn't enjoy anything like what we had established, limited though it was, in this country. And we have, of course, expanded the franchise in the years since then. But now you look at the Declaration and you see what Jefferson was doing. He was placing us in the natural law tradition that holds that there's a higher law of right and wrong from which to derive the positive law, the actual law, and against which to criticize it at any point in time. We all understand what that notion is when we try to argue against something in which the law goes the other way. The abolitionists did not point to the positive law. They pointed to the higher law because the positive law sanctioned slavery. The suffragettes who wanted to have the vote for women didn't point to the positive law because the positive law did not allow women to vote. The civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s did not point to the positive law because that was the source of the problem. So this notion of a higher law is really the moral law. And that's what you have to get clear about first to understand what's going on in those famous phrases in the Declaration of Independence that begin, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Jefferson was there placing us in the natural law tradition more precisely the natural rights strain of that tradition that is rooted in reason, not in theological considerations, but in reason. And he started with the premise of equality. All men are created equal. And he did so by implicitly invoking a rule of parsimony. You want to start with the simplest premise. If someone wants to claim rights superior to those of someone else, that's a more complex premise, and the burden is upon him to prove it. So the default position is equal rights. And he defined those rights as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it's important to notice that he hasn't talked about government yet because the project is to show how you can get a legitimate government with legitimate powers. So you can't start with a government because you will be involved in a circular argument. So you start in a world without government. It's called state of nature theory. And you try to show what our rights and obligations are vis-a-vis -vis each other. So we'll know what rights and obligations we have 
to exercise, to bring into being a government and empower that government. And that was his strategy. In this notion of a right to pursue happiness, you have a fundamental insight into the mind of the classical liberal. What makes you happy isn't necessarily what makes me happy. You may like to smoke, I may not. You may like chocolate, I may like vanilla. And we each have our different tastes, our different values. What he was addressing there by implication was a problem that we inherited from philosophy all the way back to antiquity. The distinction between skepticism and dogmatism. The skeptics held that there were no moral truths, or if there are, we can't know them. The dogmatists held that there were truths all over the place relating to every aspect of the human condition, pertaining to what sexual practices you can engage in, what you can put in your body, the roles of women in society, and so on and so forth. Neither of those alternatives was attractive. Skepticism gives you no morality, nothing to get hold of. Dogmatism gives you no liberty. And so what you want to have is a view that allows you to chart a course between those two unattractive alternatives so you can have morality and liberty at the same time. And you do that by distinguishing rights and values. Two moral notions that come from different domains of morality, as the Oxford jurisprudence H.L.A. Hart has put it. The idea being that each of us has a right, an objective right, to pursue happiness as he works his way through life. By pursuing his values, even though that may offend his neighbor, provided only that he doesn't violate the rights of his neighbor by taking anything that belongs free and clear to his neighbor, his life, his liberty, or his neighbor's property. And there's your starting point for the theory of rights. Now, of course, we don't live in splendid isolation on Black Acre or White Acre. We associate with other people, and there are two morally relevant ways in which we do so, either voluntarily by making promises or entering into contracts, or by force, by committing torts or crimes. And in both cases, what we do when we enter into contracts or commit torts or crimes is change the world of rights and obligations. We extinguish the general rights that I just spoke of, and we bring into being new special rights between the parties to the contract or the tort or the crime. So let me just say a bit more about these two kinds of rights, general and special. General rights are those that we hold against the world, against everybody. They are essentially the rights to be free, the rights to be left alone. Special rights are those that we hold only against those people that we have entered into contracts with or have committed wrongs against. All of these rights are reducible ultimately to property, broadly understood, as John Locke put it, the philosophical father of the American tradition, lives, liberties, and estates. So a right violation is the taking of something that belongs to someone else, his life, his liberty, or his property. And so what you have now is the foundation for the theory of rights. If you are free, then you can, if you are to respect your neighbor, abide by three fundamental rules. And these are so simple, you can understand them on the playground. First, don't take what belongs to somebody else. That's the whole world of property. Two, keep your promises. That's the whole world of contracts. And three, if you fail in one or two, give back what you've wrongly taken or wrongly withheld. That's the whole world of remedies. Now, there is a fourth rule, and this brings us back to our subject. It is optional. It is called do some good as you work your way through life. You don't have to. You can be an SOB, or you can be a decent person, a good Samaritan. And I'm alluding here to the good Samaritan issue because it is the welfare state writ small. The idea is, if you're a decent person, you will come to the aid of the drowning child. You don't have to. The child doesn't have a right to be rescued. You don't have an obligation to do it. 
but you ought to do it. So how can I possibly say that you don't have an obligation to do it, but you ought to do it? It's because those terms, as I said, come from different domains of morality. Obligation and rights come from the strict realm of rights theory rooted in reason. The idea of doing what you ought to do comes from our values. Most of us, I hope, would come to the rescue of the drowning child if he can do it without great cost to himself. Why is it important to draw this distinction? It's because we have a fundamental respect for liberty, for the right of everyone to plan and live his own life, to be as much as he can or to be as little as he can, to make as little of his life as he, as he wants to. That's what freedom is all about. When you try to force people to be good, that's when you start getting into trouble. Now Jefferson went on and he talked about government next, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Notice government is twice limited. It's limited by its ends to secure our rights and by its means which must be consented to. That's the vision that emerges from the Declaration, a world of live and let live, each of us free to pursue happiness as he thinks best with government there to secure those rights and do the few other things that we've authorized it to do. And that's the same vision that the framers, 11 years later, took with them when they drafted the Constitution. Now, Mike spoke of the Constitution as something that should be decided by people in the current generation. That would be nice, except that you'd have to have that written in the law of the Constitution, too. And that would mean you'd have to respect the language of the Constitution. But the language of the Constitution does not say this is an empty vessel to be filled by transient majorities or willful judges. It says the federal government is given certain powers and only those powers. And if it does something beyond what is it authorized to do, it is acting ultra virus or beyond the law or unconstitutionally. It also sets forth a series of rights that provide for how, if the government is authorized to act, it must do so in a right respecting way. That is the genius of the Constitution, and it's wrapped up in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. The Ninth says the enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. In other words, we have rights both enumerated and unenumerated. Just because you don't find a right in the Constitution doesn't mean you don't have it. It falls to the court, ultimately, if the court were to understand the theory of rights I'm talking about now, which unfortunately they do not, it falls to the court to discover these unenumerated rights. And the Tenth Amendment says, the powers not delegated to the United States Constitution, uh, to, to the government by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. In other words, unlike the rights side, on the power side, the government has only those powers that are enumerated in the document. And you look at the document and you see there is no power to take from A to give to B. The, co the founders understood these issues. They understood the importance of not establishing a welfare state. In particular, it would destroy the discipline that is necessary to preserve freedom. And I submit that this is exactly what we are seeing today. In particular, when we look at a federal budget that expends 40% of, 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 uh, uh, of the federal budget is borrowed money, you cannot go on for long under that kind of a situation. Moreover, when you look at the debt of the nation, which is now over $16 trillion, and with the baby boom generation coming on, it's going to explode after that, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that we are headed in the wrong direction. 
And I submit that it is the welfare state in all of its ramifications that has enabled this to happen. And you look at the transfer payments that are taking place, and you will see that it is not primarily aid to the poor. It is aid to the middle class in a thousand and one different ways, as well as to the upper classes. Mike rails against the last, and I agree with him. But we have put in place the system that has allowed that to happen. You create these institutions, and what you get is an arrangement whereby those best able to work the system will do so, as opposed to the people who are least able, who are less connected. And we see this over and over again. And we see it because in the 1937-38 Constitutional Revolution, we abandoned the fundamental principles that the framers set forth. And we thought that we could engage in the kind of redistribution that Mike talks about. Well, the problem is that it's like getting a little bit pregnant. Once you start down that road, it is a vicious cycle of ever more people coming to the fore to demand theirs because someone else is getting his. And you have the behavior at the margin that you need to worry about. And I can give you example after example. I'll give you simply the example of California. For the first time in its history, it did not get a new member of the House. Why? Because the population didn't increase sufficiently to enable it to do that. And then you look more closely, and what do you see is happening in California? People are leaving and people are coming in. Who's coming in? The tax takers. Who's living? Leaving? The taxpayers. That's what we call a death spiral. And it doesn't take, once again, a rocket scientist to realize that that can't go on. And all you need to do is look at places where it has been allowed to go on, Detroit, Stockton, California, and other places around the country. And you see that eventually you get the bankruptcy. And when you get the bankruptcy, at the federal level, there's only one way out, and that's to print money. And we all know what printing money leads to, the kind of inflation that destroys an economy. And we've seen the examples of that around the world. And so I'm going to conclude as follows. We need to restore the integrity that the Constitution was meant to establish. And that means that you are perfectly free as an individual to engage in all the iliomacenary activities you wish, to contribute to the United Way, to all kinds of charitable organizations, and we are a charitable people. But so much of our wherewithal is going into the government where they take their cut and then some of it comes back out with strings attached that is creating the situation that we have today. We'd have been far better off if we had led it to private charity as we did in the, 18th, the 19th century. But the progressives thought that they could do a better job than private charity did. Indeed, their idea was not simply to supplant or to, uh, to supplement private charity. Their idea was to replace private charity with public charity with professionals trained at the Columbia School of Social Work because they were social engineers. They knew better than the rest of us, this enlightened cadre, how to plan our lives for us, for benighted souls that we were. I'll conclude then with one final point. I wasn't born of well-to-do parents. My father had a ninth grade education. My mother earned her teacher's degree the year I graduated from high school. I worked my way through Columbia driving a taxi in New York nights and weekends while I went to school during the day and I worked my way through graduate school selling great books of the Western world. I was one of the few, uh, probably I was the only student that actually read them. And so I, 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 you can come up from humble beginnings. The town I grew up in 
was 150 people, and we lived five miles outside the town. It was across from a beaver pond. That's how rural it was in the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains. And so you can come up from this. Lots of people have done it. It's the story of America, and it can be done in America because America is free. Lots of, lots of stuff to discuss there. Mike, let me get your thoughts on something Roger just said. That Roger said that, that public welfare, quote, destroys the discipline that is necessary to preserve freedom. Wow, that's dire. I mean, are you trying to I, I kill, no, kill freedom? That's, that really rolled off the tongue very nicely. I have no <laughs> idea what he means by that, I have to say. I, um, so, so look, um, there are good pro uh, government programs and there are bad government programs. And so um, the uh, um, Ro Rogers uh, talks about um, corporate welfare, and it's dangerous to talk about it here in the state, but the sugar subsidy, um, um, th those are really bad. And yes, I think that kind of welfare, I don't know whether it destroys freedom, but it, 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 it's counterproductive, it wastes money, we shouldn't do it. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other government programs that are good. And, and so Roger talks about the good old days in the uh, uh, 19th century and before the New Deal. And in the good old days, um, I don't know. I, I'm just, I have to t tell you honestly, I'm taking these statistics, just pulling them out of the air. Maybe 70, 80 percent of old people were poor. Um, Today, old people are not poor by and large, and that's because of Social Security. No, the kids and are that, poor. And that's um, and, uh, and, and the kids are not poor because of Social Security. Oh. Um, I'm sorry. That's not the, 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 the main cause of poverty in the United States is not the Social Security uh, system. Um, so, so I don't. I think we have to make uh, contextual judgments about uh, which pro which programs work and which don't. And you know, so if um, if there's a uh, particular program for poor people that uh, turns out wh wh where the effect on incentives outweighs the benefits of it, we ought, ought not to have it. The Reagan administration, which, where Roger worked, was um, strongly in favor of the earned income tax credit. And I happen to think that that's a terrific program, in part because it, it helps working poor people. Um, so. So we have to make judgments about things like that. Can, can I say a couple of other things? Or, uh, You've got to, yeah. He, he's yeah. really, Roger has gotten under my skin. So I, um, <laughs> I <laughs> always do. <laughs> he's very good at that. Um, there are, and what, what's just so frustrating about this is that there, I think I agree with sort of most of his starting premises, and then we get to a conclusion that just doesn't seem to follow at all. So for example, uh, I just could not agree with you more, Roger, that the place to start is not with positive law. The place to start is um, with what people's rights are uh, and, and, and with moral law. And that's why I don't think we should decide these questions by reference to the Constitution, uh, because the Constitution is positive law. And so to the extent the Constitution embodies an attractive view of rights, we ought to follow it, but to the extent it doesn't, we ought not to. And I would have thought you would agree with that. The, the, the yeah, irony. Yeah. Let me finish. Yeah, you'll, you'll get the <laughs> time. I'm, 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 the irony, I'm infinitely patient. The irony of uh, your relying on the Declaration of Independence and Jefferson um, is just palpable. So the Declaration of Independence was itself um, a declaration of. The, 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 the framers were going to disobey the Constitution as it existed at that time. That is to say, the English Constitution, because they thought it was unjust. Um, and Jefferson, if he said it once, he said it 50 times, that he did not believe that one generation had the power to bind another generation to a constitutional language. Jefferson committed the most uh, important constitutional violation in our history. He Despite the fact that he himself thought it was unconstitutional, he completed the Louisiana Purchase because he my, thought my, it was good for the country. And by the way, when you talk about the abolitionists, on. one, more, one more thing. Uh, when you talk about the abolitionists, geez, William Lloyd Garrison burned the Constitution in public. He said it was a pact with the devil. 
uh, Wendell Phillips said the United States, are, the, the, the North ought to secede from the South. Okay. So what let's, on let's, earth are you talking about? Let's start about? here. The, the uh, Revolutionary War uh, people uh, disobeyed the Constitution, the, the English Constitution, because they thought it was unjust. Mike, you obviously haven't studied history. Uh, I'm sorry, Roger. <laughs> that is that is there are a lot of things you can say, but not that. Well, I've then, a lot then, of times. Then, <laughs> then, then you were miseducated. I went because, to the University of Chicago. Yeah, well, then you got, <laughs> and you didn't learn. You didn't learn your lesson there. They they were fighting to restore their rights as Englishmen. They were they they the point was that King George and Parliament were violating their rights as Englishmen. That's why they went to war. I mean, this is this is settled history by this point in time. Now there are several other things they, that they rejected the force of positive law because their now, rights as you Englishmen said, were violated. Good. Now that reminds me of some other uh, erroneous <laughs> remark you made, uh, and that is that uh, why are you looking to positive law in the Constitution to answer these questions? Why don't you look to the higher law? Well, as I think I made clear, I look to the positive law of the Constitution because it is based on the higher law of the Declaration. When the framers sat down, they didn't just say, what shall we do? What they did was draw upon 2,000 years of uh, writings in this area, especially uh, in the classical liberal tradition of modernity, and consulted that to draft the Constitution. So I'm not looking just at the Constitution. I'm looking at the Constitution because it reflects this higher law. But you, on the other hand, would strip the Constitution of all this higher law and turned it over to majorities I didn't to say fill that. The, what you said, we said, said the, the Constitution is irrelevant. That was your first point. And that uh, we need it, uh, that, that what we should do is, is, is put it to a vote whether we should do this, that, or the other thing. Well, it turns out that that's an invitation to the tyranny of the majority. And the reason we have a Constitution is to protect us from the tyranny of the majority. They could have said a, written a constitution that said, we authorize government and empower it to do whatever the majority from time to time shall ask it to do. They didn't, because the last thing they wanted was that kind of, they understood, they had read the history of democracies in ancient Greece. They understood that Plato and Aristotle were very uh, suspicious of democratic rule. It was better, as, as uh, uh, Churchill said, than any other form, but it is replete with difficulties if it is merely majoritarian rule. It is majoritarian rule limited by those areas that are available for the majority to rule in. And there are only 18 powers enumerated in Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution. And it is further limited instrumentally in the sense that if the government does have a power to act in this area, then it must do so in a right-respecting way. Finally, when we get back now to the uh, real world and the dilemmas before us, you, you took umbrage at my, uh, my point that, yes, the children of the, of the retired are now the ones paying the price. When Social Security started, there were 16 contributors to every recipient. We are down now to under three. Now, you don't, once again, have to be a mathematician to realize that that can't go on. I mean, if three of you young people are carrying on the backs one old person who's probably living fairly well under current arrangements, and when it gets to be two of you doing it, you realize that that paycheck, when you look at it, could be a lot uh, richer if you didn't have to carry these people this way. But that's the way it was set up as a Ponzi scheme. That is exactly what it is. It depends upon ever more people coming in as contributors. It's like the chain letter. And of course, when you have the demographic shifts that we've had, that's not going to work. We're not going to settle the constitutional issue. We are. No. I, well, I don't think so, unless we want to stay a couple more hours, yeah. and then we probably still wouldn't. But. Perhaps maybe let me ask you this, that, that you know, we're in a city in New Orleans right now that there are a lot of people in our community that really seem worse off due to no fault of their own. 
they're in, as Mike talked about, schools where they're not really learning much of anything. They go public they, schools. That's why you've got school choice in New Orleans. Though. Well, let's let's not get into school choice oh, for a second. Why not? Because <laughs> I don't think it's as good as you think it is in New Orleans. Uh, well, it, it's it, it, as compared to what? That's all. You know, we don't live in utopia. It's always a case of as compared to what. That's that's true. But what? Let, let's focus on welfare for at least poor people, because you guys both seem to agree that corporate welfare is perhaps not the best way of using public funds. What about poor people? What about people who are who do seem to be worse off due to no fault of their own? Why not take some money from some people who seem to have more than enough and, and distribute it's, it in it's, such a way to... You, you seem to imply that uh, Bill Gates, whose uh, name was raised by Mike, would not do anything if, unless he were forced to do that. Well, of course, we all know that Bill Gates has set up a charitable foundation that is giving millions and millions to people. They, they, now, there's, a, there's an interesting um, dynamic here. It turns out that the lower the income is, the greater proportion of money that people give charitably. It turns out to be that the folks on the Upper West Side of New York are some of the stingiest charitable people in the world. And uh, I hate to um, associate you with the Upper West Side, Mike, but ideologically, that's uh, for your opponents. So I, I just <laughs> with the New York Review. I, of I, uh, I don't think that um, I give nearly as our family gives nearly as much as we should, but we give a lot. Okay. Um, we, we essentially tithe. We give about ten percent of our wealth to, to poor people, and we give it to people who are um, um, who don't have enough to eat. And don't have a, a food on their uh, food on their table, and don't have a uh, roof over their head. And and I'm I think um, we all should do that. I'm I'm in favor of it, and I'm in favor of people on the uh, I am too. Upper West Side doing it. But look, um, uh, the fact of the matter is that people are free to give now, and that is not solving the problem. Of many, many people who, through no fault of their own, are are desperately poor and, and should not. And so, so Roger, I, I agree with you. You, you said um, we ought to start with higher law, and the, the Constitution is good because it embodies higher law. Yes. Well, okay, whether that's true or not depends on what you think the higher law is, and there is, I think, where we have a disagreement. So, you say that um, you are. Um, a believer in liberty. Well, so am I. But um, in my view, um, people who are desperately poor um, don't have a lot of liberty. It's tough to um, um, do much uh, free speech when you're, you, you have to spend all your time just worrying about putting food on the table. And so, uh, yes, I'm in favor of liberty, but I don't think it's acceptable that um, because of the stinginess of people on the Upper West Side, um, um, there's not enough private charity uh, to give people the kind of um, liberty and justice that, that they deserve. Well, how do you know if, in terms of, if, it, if indeed all the money that's going through the tax system today were put back into people's pockets that there wouldn't be enough? You pre you're well, just simply I'm, taking that I'm, I'm, as an opera no, I, I, I know that. And in fact, during the 19th century, there was a, a private charity that took care of um, uh, uh, that took care of people. Now, generally, people were not as wealthy in the 19th century as they were in the 20th. But that's a techno technical technological thing. I mean, the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. has produced a huge amount of wealth, and that happens to explain a lot of the increase in wealth, not not transfer payments. So I, I think, actually, if you look at um, uh, these, these cross-national comparisons are complicated and dangerous, but if you look at countries um, with relatively higher uh, tax rates and relatively well-developed uh, social welfare states, they have lower levels of poverty. I'm thinking here of Germany and the Scandinavian countries, yeah. for there, example. There are demographic um, um, but, but, and, and, and I, I just really disagree with you about that, that in the 19th century, uh, things were just fine and dandy. They, That's not what I said. They, they were, um, <laughs> um, there, there was a reason why the progressives did what uh, they did, because, because um, the levels of, of uh, Poverty that emerged with the growth of the uh, 
Uh, but but the accusation was very serious. When, when and, push and comes to shove, Mike, you are in favor of taking from A and giving to bet, B. You bet I am. That's you right. Bet I and am. That's, uh, because, uh, because I don't think... And because I don't you think know where, B, where, where the money is best no. to, directed. I mean, and I'm for, I'm for ta taking from A to give, and giving to B because I don't think that there's any strong sense in which a person who is born into wealth and doesn't spend a minute earning it Deserves that money. My What's the? Wait a minute. What's dessert got to do with it? You're going to therefore. I, you're so going uh, to, my conception of so justice. Words, is if you I want to give with, your children what you've earned, what you've set aside all from working a whole lifetime, you should be deprived from doing that. Absolutely, because there are other people who need it more. Oh, oh, uh, I see. So, well, who appointed you king? I didn't appoint myself king. This is, no, see, we live, at, we live, I, I you're the one who says you don't want democracy. No, no. I, I, I think, I, I, I no, a, I, I say that people should be free to make that decision so themselves. I, and I say that we as the people of the United States ought to have that freedom. Ah. And so I, I have a perfect right to say how I think people ought to vote. But you're I'm not saying gonna, that, you're I'm not saying they have to vote me that, to, right? You're also going to compel me to that. See, I mean, I'm leaving you perfectly free to do what you want with your I'm money. Not, I'm sorry, I'm not perfectly free if I don't have a roof on my head. That's not head. true. You are free. You don't have the power. There's a, you, you got to distinguish freedom from power. They're different and, concepts. And you know, so, so this is um, sort of a... Yeah, I'm not free to jump 50 feet in the air. <laughs> or yeah. to beat LeBron oh, James on the basketball court. Look, um, we we can't do anything about your being LeBron James on the ba basketball. Uh, well, uh, uh, but I bet I can beat you on the basketball. <laughs> we could do something. Oh, yeah? That's what yeah. I like to see. <laughs> you know, we're going outside. You know, we after could take this, this outside right now. <laughs> but but that's not something we can't do anything about that. But we can do something about the fact that people don't have a roof over their head. And if yeah, we can do. We can let people uh, be, be. You know, what I'm talking about is respect. You can respect people's decision not to do what they ought to do while you yourself do what you ought so to I, do and and you know you can you can uh, you can criticize these people who uh, who are without charity uh, and you know this is what a free society is all about and the problem today is that we don't live in we live in a society in which we we live in a modern redistributive and regulatory state which is a far cry from from the kind of free society that would allow the kind of charitable uh, world that you want to see done. My point is that you'll get better charity through freedom than you will through coercion. So, well, let me ask you that, Mike. So let's mm -hmm. say we reduce the tax rate down to something like 5%. Do you think we see a, a better situation for the people living in poverty right now due to an increase in charity or not? I, so Roger's right. Uh, that's not hasn't happened and it's not going to happen so who knows but I just think it's really unlikely um, and I the, the government um, does a lot of things that benefit a lot of people and I agree we have a, a, a deficit problem um, and therefore I mean, the main drivers of the deficit problem could be solved by getting rid of the Bush tax cuts and by having a single-payer system uh, that would actually control medical costs, um, and then we wouldn't have a deficit problem. Well, Obamacare uh, is in is in free fall with respect I, to well, the, the uh, appreciation. It's by not the a single problem. payer system, then. that's part of the problem. Right? I see. So you're going to bring it. So now you're going to coerce medical care too. Uh, uh, like have a system like, like Medicare. Yes, yeah. Then right. what did the head of the Canadian of the Canadian <laughs> medical system do when he needed an operation? He went to the United States. The head of the system because he didn't want to wait oh, nine right. months. Sorry, I'll let you. That's all right. I, I um, <laughs> let's see. Where, where, where well, see, we? It seems to be a, a moral issue because, Mike, you think that if we, if we gave everyone a larger pot of money, you, you wouldn't see the type of generosity that Roger is talking about. So uh, this, this is actually really an important point. Um, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that most people have inconsistent preferences uh, depending on whether they're thinking of themselves as private individuals or whether they're thinking of themselves as public citizens. So I'll just give an example for me. Um, I regularly vote for people who, race, who are going to raise my taxes because when I get in the voting booth, I'm a public citizen 
and I think that um, I pay a scandalously low tax rate. But as a private person, when I fill out my tax return, I don't voluntarily give money um, to the government. Why not? Uh, because I just think of it differently. And, and you do too, Roger. So, no. so I vote for people who are going to lower my yeah, taxes. Yeah, but and you, when I fill out my tax return, I, know I that, uh, pay but the minimum. You, but you and everybody else uh, behave uh, differently. Rationally. Yes. <laughs> You know, no, I just he want to say I, 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 this is really an important point. I started out uh, this discussion saying that I always learn something from you, and I do. Um, and you spoke a moment ago about um, respect, and I respect you. And for that reason, I don't think that it's um, appropriate for you in a public setting like this to, to talk about me as being irrational. I'm not no, calling you names. I'm using the term technically. Me. Rational I don't care what means. Um, we have a disagreement about what rational beings well, well, do, and, and, and it's rational people can have rational disagreements. Oh, absolutely. With, without I'm, calling hold on. I'm going to put him in time out for a minute. Can, can we get to the moral issue just for a second? Because it seems to be a, a pretty important, or for, for me as, a, as someone who, who works in ethics and moral philosophy, I want to know that does the government, so if, if people aren't going to be generous, so let's assume that for a second, and perhaps that's not something we should assume, but let's assume that for a second. Drop the tax rate down to 5%. You see either the same amount of problems right now or more. Do you think that the, the state, and by that I mean the, the people as a whole, has an, a moral obligation to do what it can to alleviate some of these problems? Yes, because, and, and I, I start from sort of very simple premises that uh, human suffering is bad and that we have um, uh, a moral obligation to try to reduce it. And there's too much suffering in the United States today. And to the extent that the government can reduce human suffering, there's a moral obligation to do that. And Rob, your uh, position no, is... I start with the same premise. Morals, uh, suffering is, uh, is bad, okay? But what I... And then he said, Mike said, and therefore, we have an obligation to address it. I don't say that we have an obligation to address it. I say we ought to address it because I want to keep obligation and rights separate as the model for law, for coercion, because law is coercion. Private I markets the coerce view. people also. What's that? Private markets coerce people. Oh, the there's, people, okay, there's the a fundamental in, difference. In pre 1964, the pre-1964 South who had to drive miles and miles to go to the bathroom were being coerced. No, that's a, I'm glad you raised that because that's a charge that has yet to be responded to. I hope you don't think that I am in favor of allowing Jim Crow kinds of situations. There is nothing in that, that any, there's nothing in, in what I said that would that would uh, support that kind of a, of a claim. The Civil Rights Act was well, long overdue, and it had to be, in, it had to also prohibit private uh, discrimination in in uh, in accommodation public accommodations in order to break the back of Jim Crow in the South. So, so Roger, I'm, I, I am, I'm delighted to hear you think that, but I am puzzled by it because I would have thought you would have said um, the, the moral right thing to do is to treat people in a non-discriminatory way, but that people shouldn't be coerced to do that because they, they, they ought to have the freedom to be racist if they want to be racist. That's exactly what I would say in an ideal situation. In 1964, we weren't dealing with an ideal situation. Well, and we're we're not now either. We were dealing with an extraordinary situation. Are you telling me that if uh, private discrimination were allowed, uh, then in that that General Motors would now uh, refuse to hire uh, African Americans or uh, or I mean, really, this this well, this, this strange well, credulity. After all, they sell cars to to people of all nationalities and ethnicities and and racial uh, backgrounds, it's, it's not in their interest. This goes way back to an essay by Gary Becker, the Nobel laureate back in 1959, showing that it is irrational Wait a words, second. against self I, I want to get to some, to, discriminate. to some audience questions, but just to preempt a question that I imagine would be first, wouldn't one argue that right now isn't an ideal situation? Oh, well, it's so far from it. What, what, well, and then, what then, then practically the government, Mike may say, and I don't want to speak for Mike, but Mike would say, look, it's not an ideal situation. The government ought to step in 
and take certain steps to alleviate these, this condition of poverty that we see across this country where people are suffering due to really no fault. And my point is that we're in this situation precisely because the government has mech, mucked up the market. The okay. more it insinuates, you know, this, this is, this is poli-sci 101. Namely, no government program ever escapes providing the foundation for the remedy to the problem that it created. One government program begets the conditions for the next government program, and on and on. I mean, do we need any better example than the way we have messed up the medical system in this country? We don't have a free market in medicine, and it comes from World War II. Why do you buy your health insurance mostly through your employer? You don't buy your life insurance. You don't buy your auto insurance. You don't buy your fire insurance from your employer. Why? Because in World War II, there were wage and price controls, okay, which muck up the market right there. Employers had a hard time keeping uh, uh, people um, on their payroll because they couldn't pay them uh, any more than was allowed. So the employers worked out a deal with the government that they would provide certain fringe benefits, health insurance being the prime one, with pre-tax dollars. Now, obviously, if you're getting your health insurance with pre-tax dollars, it's cheaper than if you have to pay for it with, with after-tax dollars. And this is how the ball started. And it has continued in that way. And it has continued with one intrusion after another in the medical uh, field as a result of which, it is chaos today. Try to find out from a hospital what the what your bill is going to be before you go in at the emergency room. You will find that it varies by tens of thousands of dollars sometimes. This is anything but a transparent free market. And so what we've got now is Obamacare coming along to address the problems that were created later. Just my point. We get one government program and a second government program, and it creates the conditions for a third program. The dirty little secret about Obamacare is that those who support it know full well that it's going to fail and therefore will parade, provide the conditions for single payer. That's what's in store for us down the road. Let's, let's take some questions. We've got 15 minutes or so. Uh, yeah, what, one thing as usual, if, when, once you're recognized, please just pause for a second so that the microphones in the ceiling can, can pick you up. Um, and then let's let's try to avoid any follow-up questions, only because we're we're a little short on time. So uh, I planned to ask a different question when I came to the panel tonight, but something you just said struck me as odd. Um, the Obamacare law, as as it is written, was what was proposed by I believe your fellows at the Cato Institute in no. the 90s oh, in response no. to no. Bill Clinton's Heritage, 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 Heritage Foundation. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. We were they're, they're wrong. Wrong. <laughs> no, we're not, no, in fact, that's a good example of where we're not all the same. They're conservative, we're libertarian. Um, um, but, okay, all right, we'll take you then. All right. Those are, those are, those are, <laughs> those are, those are easy questions. <laughs> yes, pause just for a second. I'm curious as to why the problem of the top 5% of the money in the United States is never addressed. The amount of money that's in the top 5% of the United States is pitiful. There's so much money in a, a, such a small amount of people that it can't go anywhere else. It can't be redistributed to the middle class because they already have all the money, so, so little amount of people that they have well, so could be money. Why, why, why is it it couldn't be redistributed? Because they already have all the money that... What? Because there are people that have billions of dollars and are living very comfortably, and they have no reason or rhyme to give any money away because it's all theirs. And there are people being born into this family, and they have they can live out very reasonable lives and very calmly. You know what I mean? Well, then what's your question? The question is why is that problem never addressed? Why? What's the problem? That, that there are rich people? No, that they, there's so much money in this percent of people. Well, is that a problem? Absolutely. Why is it a problem to get rich? No, no, the problem is. Way more money than anybody could ever need ever. Well, how's that happen? Presumably, the problem is is mm -hmm. the creation of dynastic wealth, which Mike was talking about earlier when you guys got into it over inheritance laws. I don't see yeah. that as a problem. I'd love to be in their sh shoes, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Well, good. Then go to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a problem um, not just 
it's not just a problem because um, there are people who don't have enough, and it, and it is frankly obscene to have people with six houses and, some, and other people with no places to live. It's also a problem because um, it affects um, our sense of national cohesion and being all in this together and being one country, um, and it affects our politics. Um, it, it bleeds over into uh, financial power, bleeds over into political power. And it, in the long run, um, we're much going to be much better off if we do have some sense that we are one country and we're all in it together. And as, as by the way, Thomas Jefferson deeply believed, um, one uh, necessary prerequisite for that was having a relatively equal distribution of wealth. Now, Mike speaks of national cohesion. There are societies that tried to bring us this equality by taking from A to B in a very systematic way. They don't exist. Well, they do exist in North Korea. Uh, and there you see a kind of uh, a national cohesion, don't you? You remember the national cohesion in the Soviet Union? That's why people uh, risked their lives to leave. But you remember the national cohesion in East Germany and the wall that they tried to scale? To, what's that? What's the problem there? No, there's not a problem. They have like an incredibly robust social welfare system, and they're doing just fine. The, the the cohesion that he's talking about is the kind where you where you're engaged in a redistribution of e egalitarianism, equality. That's the kind of thing that, that the welfare system that you've got in Europe is is breeding problems. I mean, I don't know what you're what you're reading about that. The unemployment rate in Europe is makes our youth the youth unemployment in Europe makes our youth unemployment <clears throat> a pale in comparison. It is so great. Let me get another here and then go to the back. Um, let's say, Roger, I, I'm interested in the libertarian approach to the deconstruction of power as it accumulates uh, in, in the upper echelons of society. Uh, and the solution seems to be to do away with um, a, a, an infrastructure that supports um, a redistribution. But as uh, Mike pointed out, don't, don't those, some of those institutions only worsen the problem of, um, doesn't that exacerbate Absolutely. the problem? Uh, I mean, if I understand your question correctly, you're saying, don't all these efforts to redistribute create even greater inequality? Uh, shouldn't we be concerned with maybe not inequality of wealth, but rather inequality of power uh, as men? Well, well, listen, uh, d d before, that's a separate question, but the point, the main point that you were focusing on is absolutely right, and that's the point I made earlier on. Daniel Patrick Moynihan put it very nicely. Those countries that have sought to achieve liberty uh, uh, rather than equality have done, uh, as opposed to those that have sought to achieve equality, uh, at the expense of liberty, have done rather better by equality than the than the other countries. In other words, you uh, if you allow liberty, uh, you will uh, get much greater equality. Now, the problem of the great wealth inequality that this previous questioner talked about is a problem. It's the same thing that took place in the Ancien Regime, where you had tremendous uh, gaps uh, between the rich and the poor. It's because, and this is public choice economics, the economists have shown this over and over again. You set up a system like this, and the people who are able to work the system will do it. And it's, this is over and over this is shown. I mean, the, the uh, sugar manufacturers uh, know how to work the, uh, the quota system. You don't, you don't write to your congressman because you're paying a nickel more for a candy bar. They stand outside the congressman's door to make sure he votes right to get them those import uh, restrictions. But, but Roger, in all fairness, Mike isn't defending the sugar subsidies. No, I know there. he's not, but, the, but, but I'm trying to explain. I'm, the, 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 no, he is, a, he is defending the system that gives us well, this wealth inequality. So, so that's, that's the point. Look, there are... Um, uh, there are uh, defects in the way that government institutions work. And you think that... Let, hold on, let, hold on. Let, let no. There's just no question about it. Um, uh, uh, public institutions don't perfectly reflect uh, the public...
public will. And Roger's quite right. Uh, public choice theorists have done a really good job of explaining uh, various pathologies that produce bad results in public policy. What Roger doesn't acknowledge is there were also defects in markets. And markets don't work perfectly either. And they also have pathologies. The main pathology they have actually, uh, I mean, they have lots of pathologies. Uh, um, it's not government that is um, <laughs> bringing uh, civilization to an end by global warming. That's, that's private trades that are occurring that's doing that. Um, uh, so so a, ma a very big pathology they have is, is private markets produce externalities, which, which um, um, if they're going to be controlled, government has to do it. Another just sort of very obvious pathology of private markets is that um, what, what are called wealth effects. Um, if you have more money, you can have more goods even though you don't value them for, for more. And that's why uh, wealthy people have happier lives than poor people. And that's also a pathology. So, so it, it's not right to just look at one side of the equation without the other. There are problems with governments. There are problems with private markets. And what we want to do is try to uh, uh, have them um, capitalize on governments where they do the job best and capitalize on private markets where they do the job best. Well, you've talked about there are problems with private markets, but you haven't given any Example of that. I just one did. example the, you the, did. The, uh, the world is coming to an end no. because of the uh, literally because of the. Uh, there's an article in the New York Review of Books this week. Oh, God. Apparently, <laughs> we are about to be overtaken by jellyfish I because see. of global warming. I see. Well, you um, obviously didn't and, read the Wall Street and, Journal day before yesterday <laughs> because it turns out that the Arctic ice cap is now 30 percent larger than it was last year. So, Look, so, and the, we haven't had without any, getting into the details of global warming. Uh, <laughs> well, I know about, that's the last thing you want to do is problem, get into the details of it. Well, <laughs> a problem about uh, a problem with private markets is that they produce externalities. Uh, that is to say, the trade between A and B that benefits both A and B, so they do it, has an effect on C, and I. I and every economist I know of thinks that's a problem with private markets. No. So, so how do you control it? Well, the way you control it is what, by what's something called the Pigouvian tax, which is government intervention to control private behavior that is producing social harms. Well, it depends what you're going to define as social harms. The externalities that fall in the area of nuisance, for example, pollution, that's exactly a role for government. And it's a role that is justified with reference to the theory of rights. You can't use your property in a way that violates the rights of your neighbor. And that's what pollution is all about. Uh, the, the, I hope you don't think that I am arguing against regulations that uh, control pollution. So, so Bill Gates is using his property in a way that violates the rights of poor people to have a roof over their head. A right to have a roof over your yes, head? Yes, you have a right to have a roof over your head. You do? Against whom? Against the government. Us. I, 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 well, so we all have a right to a roof over our head against That's each right. other. Because we're human beings. That is, so that we're is all in this together, our, right? That is, that is an aspect of our humanness. And I think this, this, right this touches on the moral This is the core of the matter. This right is the here. core of the moral disagreement. So That's let me right. get, we've got five more minutes. Let me and get, we'll get to the bottom of it in the back, five yes. minutes, right? Well, no, we haven't gotten to yeah. the bottom of it in, in 90 minutes, so. Next years, if the majority of the welfare programs were cut today, like how long about do you think it would take for power to balance out? Who's this question? Is this question for Roger? Or for both of them. Okay. If the welfare programs were ended tomorrow? Yes. Well, we would probably therefore have some farmers screaming because ethanol subsidies would, would go. Uh, we would also have some uh, sugar importers screaming because uh, we'd have more, uh, more uh, imported sugar in. Uh, we know what happens when the steel companies uh, complain about imported steel and so on and so forth. And with respect to poor people, I think that you would have, first of all, a reduction in the taxation if it were commensurate with the decrease in the contributions. You would have private charity rising to the, to the issue. 
And uh, the trouble is, we can't do that today because no one will allow the experiment to take place. We, 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 do, we do have an empirical, we have what, what, what social scientists call a natural experiment about this, and I frankly don't know what the answer is, and, and maybe Roger does. But So uh, with the Bush tax cuts, um, there was a substantial reduction in the tax rate. And the question is, did private charity increase? Well, look at, I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, there I, is, I a, there is an experiment. Means. It was the Clinton administration, uh, during the Clinton administration, that the welfare, federal welfare program was ended. And it turns out that it didn't, and it didn't result in catastrophe. It didn't result in catastrophe. It resulted in, in more people uh, having unjust suffering. Well, well, no, and this no, is a fact, no, facts issue. This is an empirical up, issue. Because we could look up and see right. what the Bush, Bush tax cuts did. Right. Private so, so look, the, the, uh, during the uh, Eisenhower administration, the marginal tax rate was 90%. Um, that has gone down very, very substantially. So I think the top rate is now, what, 30-something percent? So, it's, so, you throw so, in state and so, local, it's well over so, 50%. So the, question, so the question is, and we could look this up, is, is it really true that people are dramatically giving more money to charity now than they were um, during the Eisenhower administration. I don't know the answer to that, but I doubt that it's true. Well, let's, let's take w one more. It would, seem, it would seem to me that part of the uh, redistribution of wealth argument, the underlying basis is that, throw, is that money actually is going to correct some of the imbalances that exist. And even though, um, as Chris mentioned, you didn't want to talk about school choice, for instance, I look at not only in New Orleans, but uh, throughout the nation here, it seems at the elementary level, at least, that all the money that has been thrown at the public school system, and it's actually no better and arguably much worse than it was even 20, 30 years ago when far less resources were devoted to it. So, I could say the same thing about uh, many of the um, cities and states that have adopted these kind of principles that throwing money at it, they're going bankrupt now and hopefully not at an accelerating pace going forward. But it just seems to me that underlying this argument is the presupposition that throwing money at it is going to help. And uh, I'm not saying it's a black and white issue. I I'm just wondering out loud Right. Whether that's actually valid, so, I, I so, tend to think it's not. So, so I, that's a really good question, and I, I actually think you're right. So I'm not for throwing money at things. I, I said at the beginning, um, I'm for good pro government programs and not for bad ones. Now, I'm not an expert on uh, public education. I really don't know much about it, but I'm prepared to believe that if you tell me it's true, that sort of there's been a lot of money wasted. And if that's true, then I'm opposed to the worst. And, I, and I, I look back at the, the war on poverty under uh, Lyndon Johnson, and here we are spending, you know, 15, 20, 30 times as much, and yet there's, well, there's actually more people supposedly living in poverty now, which, again, I would argue with when you look at all the benefits. I, I, so the war on poverty is a mixed bag. There were things that were done that, that didn't work. There were things that were done that did work. Um, um, so, so one thing, for example, that survived and that, that um, uh, I, I think, again, I'm not an expert on this, but I think it works quite well, is Head Start. Um, if you're talking about education, that's actually um, uh, made a substantial difference, uh, I think. If I'm wrong about the facts, I'm not an expert on education. But so, so we need to be smart about this, right? No, I'm not for throwing money at things. I'm for trying to think hard about what governments can do that will help people. Mike just made a statement that uh, I can agree with so that we can end on a note of agreement. Outstanding. And, and that is that uh, he said, and I agree, that he is not, uh, uh, he's not in favor of bad government programs, only in favor of good programs. And I agree entirely. It's just that the range of good government programs that he finds attractive are precisely those that I find unattractive. In fact, it turns out that the program he talked about, Head Start, we have done a study on that, and other studies have done that, that the, the, whatever gains are made are, uh, are lost by about the third grade. 
And so the, we're putting millions of, throwing millions of dollars at that and lots of other programs, and it turns out they just don't work. And at the end of the day, it turns out that this is all about choice. Do you want to make the choices that affect your life, or do you want someone else to make them for you? That's what's behind the school choice movement. Parents have simply had it with not having any say over the education of their children under the public system. The last thing the teachers want is parental involvement beyond the most minimal level. In fact, when you look at these programs, you find that it's the poor people in the inner city who are clamoring most for school choice programs in the District of Columbia. This is overwhelmingly the case. And who is opposing this? The government of the District of Columbia because they're in the pockets of the unions. And that's the dirty little secret of this uh, whole undertaking. At the end of the day, do you make the choice relating to your life or do you expect someone else in Washington or Baton Rouge or wherever to make the choice for you? Mike, can I give you the last word, 30 seconds, to respond to that, and then we can wrap it up? Um, so um, school choice is really an interesting example. Um, yes, um, um, school choice may be a good thing, but if it's a good thing, it's a good thing because um, poor people don't have to pay the tuition to go to a private school because, in fact, um, people don't poor people don't have the freedom to go to a private school if they can't afford to pay the tuition. How are they, how are they going to pay the tuition? They're going to pay the tuition if somebody is taxed to transfer the money to them so that they can pay, they can uh, cover the costs of uh, a private school that they choose. On, on that note, thank you for coming and please join me again and thank you. Thank Roger. you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Chris. Thank you, Mike. That was fun. That was Chris, thank you. Let's do it. Absolutely. Well, Mike, we've done it again. Yep. <laughs>